Thank you. All right, now I am going to leave and Chris is going to begin. All right, thank you. Welcome everyone from somewhat snowy uh, Towson University campus. As you can see, I'm in my office. I decided today it was a good idea to, to drive in and I was right. The roads were pretty empty and um, snow, if you're not near Towson, snow is gently falling on the campus and the walkways, the, the roads, they're all clear on campus. So I'm not encouraging anyone to come down. I'm just describing. I'm being your journalist for the moment. So um, I want to uh, start by telling you uh, how lovely the last six to eight weeks have been in a certain way for me. Um, as you know, this is the time of year uh, to read through all kinds of proposals from uh, members of the college. So starting with sabbatical proposals earlier on in the semester last year, and then um, followed by the PTRM materials, and then more recently by the comprehensive review materials. And I've gotten to know now several dozen of you quite well through these materials. I've also gotten to know uh, you and others through the individual committees that I sit on or the council, um, individual meetings we've had. And some of you have been uh, so kind to take time to write to me uh, personally and, and share your thoughts and questions. And I feel like I've gotten to know now more of who the college you know, is, meaning all of you. And I am even more impressed than when I arrived uh, in July. So I'm really, I, I feel like I, I've been very fortunate to get to know you in these different ways. And I'm looking forward to getting to know you this way and other ways as we move forward. And one of the things that struck me and continues to strike me, of course, is that um, in addition to all the wonderful things you do, how much your teaching, your research, your engagement really um, ha opens up opportunities for cross-departmental collaboration in teaching in the classroom, uh, in your curricula, in your research, uh, grant writing, community outreach, and other activities. And of course, um, there are many uh, ways we can reach across the campus. So all of these things are really great. Um, for me to discover in a more real concrete way than just getting to know you, you know, as I did before I arrived or in these circumstances, which really present a lot of obstacles for us to getting to know each other. So I want to um, continue on that reference to the beginning of my time here and go just a little bit um, to the to the very beginning and a little bit farther back. So from even before my appearance on campus or in Towson, um, I've been asked by many of you, and sometimes more than once, well, what are you going to do? Okay, so here you are, the new dean. What are you going to do? What are your priorities? So I want to begin by sharing my screen and then sharing uh, some of my priorities. Let's see if we get this right. Here we go. I think we're fine. So if you recall, um, when I came to campus in March, last year, one of the fundamental questions that I asked in my job talk is, what will a 21st century university education look like? And so um, if you remember, I talked about um, my vision of a model for the 21st uh, century and universities. And I talked about uh, the College of Liberal Arts as an innovator, as a bridge builder. I talked about um, one of our missions um, being uh, to address the whole person, um, looking at students uh, as people who come, individuals who come to us from you know, different communities, they have a whole wide variety of activities. We never really see, we may learn about some of them uh, in our interactions uh, with them in our classes and beyond. So we, we look at the, individual student as someone with a moral compass, someone who should be socially responsible, someone who should be civically engaged. And while many of our students come to us with all three of these things well-developed, 
there's more to be done. And some of them don't come with all three areas so well developed. So we wanna look at our students in a more holistic way. That's part of what our, our job should be in the college. Um, I also talked about um, cross-disciplinarity and the importance, <clears throat> pardon me, the importance of working together, not just in name or not just in our research, reading about different fields, approaches to our topics, but how to actually engage each other and our students in what we do here at the university. I also uh, talked about the need for the 21st century university to be very socially justice minded. Now that can happen on a number of levels, but action is really important. How do we put social justice into action? And then I talked about um, diversity in ways we're familiar with, access, uh, retention, completion. Uh, and, and we usually talk about that when we're talking about students. But I broadened that and said, we need to also include faculty and staff when we think about access, retention, and completion. It's not just something that belongs to the students. And then I talked about um, my style of leadership, which by now you should um, have gathered that it's collaborative, it's, it's transparent, of course, that's very open. Um, I'm very interested in my own, but everyone else's discovery, right? and sense of responsibility so that we take ownership for what we do, not only in our lives on campus, but beyond as well. So um, that led me to, uh, in October, to um, a conversation with the provost about um, what CLA can do to provide answers and solutions uh, for the greater public and personal good based on the questions I just put up there on the screen and um, what I had observed on campus, but also um, about the state of the country. Okay, so this was October, it was still before the election and the more exciting events that have happened since then. Exciting and troubling at the same time, right? So I decided that it would be important to think in terms of a theme that could uh, engage all of us in the college in different ways, but give us some sort of umbrella, sort of uh, cohesion and unity to move forward. So this is what I call, and, and some of you have heard this already, the thematic deanship. Um, it's, it's relevant to my vision of the liberal arts and higher education. And it's, it's something that should take on uh, a topic that's timely and meaningful to what is happening in the world today. And that of course changes all the time, right? October, the world looked a little bit different than it does today. Uh, it should be a theme that can unify all of us, uh, no matter what we do, where we sit in the college, and in the way that um, all CLA departments should be able, and programs should be able to uh, engage and embrace uh, this theme in a variety of ways with the possibility of engaging in the rest of the, the community, the rest of the campus community, the other colleges. It should be a theme that can be enduring in its impact, not something that students come into the university like at so many other universities and they're immersed for four or five, six years that they're here in a certain culture, a certain worldview that doesn't really follow them when they leave the campus. We want to think about something that can be really enduring. And then we need um, to consider, well, how will all of this actually help to educate a citizenry, right? Not necessarily people with a US citizen passport or citizenship, but the people who make up this country, okay? How does this help um, to educate them uh, to appreciate and um, practice critical thinking, um, as well as the scientific processes? Um, and how do we help students then to also engage differently in their communities, right? And I'm happy, not necessarily today, but uh, in the future to talk about all of these in more detail uh, with you. But in any case, so the theme that I've settled on and um, is democracy with a small d in the 21st century. So this is really something that has become really come front and center uh, in the news in writing about education, about the state of the nation, uh, especially since January 6th, but not only. It's hard to open up a newspaper, to see a news show, to, to read a feed online 
and not come across some aspect of questioning, like what does it mean to have a democratic society? What does truth mean? What does evidence, what role, what place do these things have? So the first task for this thematic approach is to start by defining what democracy is today for us in this country. And, um, and then after that, what we want to ask, well, what makes a 21st century society democratic? So we can start at a very theoretical high level, which we're all very good at, but then now let's start coming down into the sort of concrete reality, even the everyday lived experiences. Um, and that's where you know, the question of the relevance of democracy can be very important. But of course, there are different aspects, different levels, and different things to look at. So what is the relevance of democracy today? This is a question that you know, a few years ago, maybe even less than that, we may never have thought of asking is centrally critical to our lives um, uh, uh, right now. And then how, how is democracy practiced and applied? Anyone who's lived in another country that um, is a demo considers itself democratic and by all you know, appearances, it is, will know that democracy takes on different meaning, different iterations, depending on where you are. It's deeply rooted in every nation's, every people's um, cultural and historical experience. And so those can't be separated. It's not a template that can be moved from place to place or carried forward from one generation to the next in the exact same uh, way or, or frame. And then what are the, the successes and failures of democracy? And how do we get to this point that we are in history? And then of course, what is the future of democracy? So this is the last of my slides. So I'm gonna unshare my screen and there we'll go back to this view. So um, these, are, these are the main aspects of what I'm calling the thematic deanship. And what I'm first gonna do is to ask um, a small group of people in the college to come together starting this spring, but, but more so to help us in the fall semester, especially to put together a broad enough definition of democracy that um, will provide a framework for the college and everything we do and all the variety of ways to approach any topic that are represented in our college, but can also provide some sort of, you know, cohesion to this work. Uh, I will ask a small group of, um, like I said, of you to do this. I will also um, ask them to consider putting together a um, small, you know, set of um, readings that we can all share with. Because in my past work, when I've worked on a big project like this, I found that it was fundamental to begin with common understandings and definitions can get us to that. And so that's where I wanna start. It won't be rigid, so rigid that people feel like I'm excluded, but it won't be so broad that it doesn't have any meaning either. And I mean, I will also be asking all of us to uh, be thinking seriously about how to, um, how to incorporate this theme into your curricula, to the way you engage with the community. And of course you're doing this, everyone is doing this, but I wanna sharpen that. And um, in, in your research, in your grant writing, uh, in fact, there's a lot of opportunity to get grants uh, on topics either specifically or related to aspects of democracy. There's an awful lot more so in the last um, few months. And, uh, and then there's a great fundraising opportunity as well, because many of our alumni who are interested in the democratic uh, enterprise um, will find this very interesting and very worthy of supporting. So this is the starting point. It's like, how do we understand ourselves and what are our shared values? And then we move uh, beyond that. This is a multi-year project. I know everyone's heard about 10 year strategic plan. We need to think long-term. This is not something that has a quick answer, a quick fix. We've talked in higher education for many, many decades about certain things that we're supposed to do that. Critical thinking is a good example. I mean, the most honest way to talk about critical thinking is to recognize not only the successes, but maybe some of the ways we, did, we didn't quite figure it out as an enterprise. Some of you have heard me talk in the past about the need for us to make sure that whatever our students learn at the university, whatever experiences that are meaningful to them 
they understand that these have to reorient or at least direct their actions throughout their life. We don't get continuing education, right? We don't get to have continuing education hours every two years or every year. This is our one shot to really make an impact. And with the percentage of the population, adult population, increasingly having a bachelor's degree, we need to think, well, what is the impact? We also need to look back at what happened on January 6th and understand the diversity of backgrounds of the people who stormed the Capitol. Um, and the more we're learning, at least I become more unsettled. Well-educated people, multiple degrees, working in professions that we would never have associated with uh, those kinds of activities. I am not saying we can reach everyone, we can't ever reach everyone, but I do think we have a lot of work to do. And I think this theme can help us to move, um, move the needle forward. So I wanna give you an example of what I think of as included in democracy, okay? I think everything we do is included in democracy. Again, if you've lived in another country or especially in one where dem democracy is absent or it's very um, new, perhaps weak, unstable, uncertain, um, you'll know why these things are important. But, um, you know, every, for example, I'm gonna ask a small group of faculty, a different group to come together and help us to put, to create a calendar of commemorative events. So what this is, is gonna be a series of events. Many of them already are in the planning or have been planned, but we wanna bring them together under, again, some sort of themes that can relate to democracy. So for example, uh, Black History Month is, we're in it right now. We should be front and center on the campus with ha having Black History Month events, Women's History Month events, exactly the same thing. Uh, but also smaller, or I don't mean smaller in importance, but individual days can be important too. Uh, for example, Juneteenth, Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, Constitution Day, and there are many others. I don't want the calendar to be so filled that there's an activity every day and, and sort of the importance and specialness of certain events or certain months is lost. But I want us to think seriously about that. And why is that important to democracy? Because who we commemorate tells a lot about how we um, relate to the democratic process, okay? The heroes that we um, want to celebrate um, sometimes the anti-heroes, we want to at least uh, you know, remember that they were around and the influence they had. We want to be able to um, celebrate at the right moments or in ways that say, hey, you know what? The past was looked at differently. It's now time to look at our democratic enterprise um, anew and to pose different questions and present it. And if you read my uh, message last week that I sent out on Monday as part of the Dean's Office Tips, you'll know that I explicitly referred to a, a, a very, very serious, I think, um, um, undermining or attempt to undermine the way many people think of democracy in this country. So I, I, I would point you in that direction too. Um, so that's, that's um, in, in a nutshell, how I am viewing the next few years um, in the college. I think it's important that we get working as soon as we can. This year has been, of course, very different because of our modality, uh, but we can start the, the groundwork this semester a bit in the summer so that we can really get off running in the fall. Um, I, shall, I, I should say now a few, um, I'll, move, I'll shift gears and give you a few updates and then talk a little bit about the fall and other things. To begin with, um, the, as you heard yesterday, if you attended Academic Senate, the enrollment turn, is turning out to look very um, strong for this semester. We're down, but we're down uh, about the amount we thought we would be down. So it's within budget. So that's really excellent. Again, if you know people at other universities, you can always find a university that has a better situation, but most universities are not as well off as Towson is. Um, and um, that's important. It's really something that goes to all the hard work you do. It also shows how dedicated our students and their family are to um, obtaining a college uh, education. Even when, if you think about it, our second year students will come back next fall, hardly having been on campus. More of their time will have been spent remotely than on campus, seeing you and interacting with other people face to face. 
So we know that next Monday we return to campus as a whole in a different way, right? About 15% of our classes will be on campus. We have several thousand students already in the residence hall. And in our building alone, we'll have um, over a thousand students at some point during the week. So it will look very different from the fall semester. It will feel, it will sound differently, but it won't be like what you were used to, right? So uh, it'll be exciting. I think there, uh, people will be cautious. Um, the building will look semi normal, I think, to you. The Dean's office, for example, will be open Monday through Friday, at eight to five o'clock. The different academic suites, I've asked them to be open throughout the week. So it's not the same coverage as the Dean's office, but they will be open. And so you and students will be able to access um, what, you know, what you need uh, uh, throughout the week, which I think will make things go much better. We'll face some of the same sets of issues as we faced when we were planning to open up in the fall semester. So for example, you know, um, how do we actually pull this off in a safe way? Um, I think um, the Cook Library managed this process very well in the fall semester. The Cook Library was open the entire semester, even during exams. It's open now, even on a closed day, but in a limited way, I think it's only the 24 seven room. But in any case, students mostly wore their masks when they were in Cook Library. And what I mean by mostly is they entered the building, they exited the building, when they moved around the space, they did have their masks on. But students who spent a long time in the library, at a, like a long stretch of time, four or five, six hours studying, <sighs> Clearly, they got tired at some point of having their masks on. So it, it, it happened that, you know, some of the librarians noticed that students like that didn't have their masks on, had to tell them, had to remind them. Other students wanted to work on group projects and they took their masks off or they violated the social distancing. Um, you know, and often when they were told to put their masks on, they responded, well, we live in the same, you know, dorm or in the same apartment. There's no way for us to know, and we don't need to know. The reality is mask on, social distance, that's it. We don't get a choice when we're on campus. Um, if this should happen in our building, no one should be thinking, oh, we have to police them. But I think just for our own well being, we're gonna say something to students. I would remind students, remember, they're coming into adulthood, they're maybe more prone to make some you know, mistakes, but we're not exempt from that either. You know? And remember what it feels like when you've forgotten to do something proper, maybe you were at the grocery store and someone felt you were too close, you probably appreciated that kind reminder rather than that snippy, you know, retort and or snippy, you know, command, step back. Um, and you can tell I've gotten both of those. Uh, but we also forget the mask occasionally. I went out of my um, went out on Sunday for a walk to enjoy the weather, and I walked across the street and realized I didn't have my mask on. That had never happened since. We had to start wearing masks. Now, no one was around, so there was safety. That was good. But nobody was around to tell me to put my mask on either. If they had been, even if they had been mean, I would have had, I would have understood. I wouldn't have gotten into an argument or disagreement. I wouldn't have said, I would have probably thanked them. And so naturally, I went back in, got my mask, came back out. Everything was fine. So don't be surprised if someone, maybe a student, maybe a staff member, maybe a colleague tells you, hey, you forgot your mask in your office, or did you remember? Um, or do you even know? Uh, and if they're even not that nice, just take it in you know, um, good measure because we're all trying to look out after each other. We're all human beings in this together. And I think we all mean well, but once in a while we make a mistake. That's what we're like as human beings. Let's move on to the fall semester. The fall semester, as you heard yesterday in the provost comments at the academic center, the plan, uh, Senate, the plan is to come back uh, face to face. We have to follow what's going on with the virus, with the vaccinations and all of that. So naturally, if, if we are not out of this situation by then, well, then we have to, you know, operate differently. But the plan is for scheduling and just planning in general is we come back face to face. Um, and the provost will put something out in writing following up her comments at Senate. Um, there are some exceptions, programs that are online anyway, they're always online and they're purposefully online, especially graduates programs, for example, those don't have to be face-to-face, -face, but the idea is that 
faculty do need to come. Full-time faculty do need to be on campus. That's how we create a campus community. And that's what the students expect of us too, all right? Now, the provost also had a couple of other comments, but I'll leave it uh, to the schedulers and also to her um, uh, comment that comes out in, in writing. We've heard a lot about the strategic plan um, and we're gonna hear a lot more. We have a lot of work to do um, and our timetable is roughly by mid to late summer. That's the, the provost has not given the colleges an exact deadline, but I think what we need to make sure is that we give ourselves enough time to finish our work, present it to the provost, and then respond to any adjustments she may need. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping by the beginning of, um, certainly by the beginning of August, but even earlier, we'll be done with our portion of the strategic plan. More details to come uh, very soon. I wanna talk about um, some of the other groups I've met with um, and some of the other work that I've done that I think is important to be aware of. And I wanna begin by uh, telling you uh, about my meeting with TERFA before the break. Um, those of you who have been on campus for a while will know better than I do that TERFA is an organization that's rather new at Towson. It's an organization of retired faculty, retired faculty from all the different colleges. So they invited me to speak to them. And one of the takeaways, uh, well, I had, there were a number of takeaways. First of all, I found this group of people to be incredibly dedicated to the university. Yes, they're retired but that doesn't mean that all of their years of service here just goes out the door. It's part of who they are as individuals. It's part of their history, their personalities. And they were goodwilled. They really want to contribute still any way they can. They have programming for themselves, especially educational programming. Some of them still will teach in your departments as you know, more or less adjuncts, right, part-time. But these are people who are fully retired. and. Um, so they asked me in the meeting and then afterwards, several of them approached me and asked me if I would consider calling upon them whenever I might need their, their help. It could be guidance, it could be advice, whatever. Uh, I, I thought that was very generous of them. And I think if you know anyone in TERFA, you should feel free to engage with them as well. Um, maybe even if it's a retired faculty member you know and has an expertise that you're interested in, the students learning more about, have them speak, whatever it might be. There are many ways to engage TERFA, but it was a really uplifting <clears throat> uh, experience to, to get to know them. And like it or not, we're all going to end up in a TERFA sort of uh, age category, right, if we're fortunate. So that's our future in a sense too. And I say this even if you're our youngest person in the audience there, that, that's how it works, right? I've spent a lot of time um, working with our institutional advancement liaison, Francis Washburn. I've um, um, very much enjoyed getting to know through Francis, some of our alumni and some of our donors, some of the alumni, most of the donors are alumni, but it doesn't always work that way. And we're, we're um, working regularly on uh, meeting more of them. Francis is introducing to them to me and then on priorities for the college that the advancement office needs. Um, the donors or the alumni that I've met with, as you might imagine, like the people on TERFA, they love the university. The university is a really important part of their histories, even though they may have only spent four years, not their entire careers here, because they shouldn't have, right? If they were just students, they should be done after a certain point. Um, it's moving to, to hear their stories, uh, it's moving to um, think about the impact we have on students' lives. You know, they come to us, these alumni are not, you know, they're not that close to being in college. Uh, one of them was probably early 40s, others were around 60, you know, and others are older. But when you think about the impact that we must have made on them, that means our predecessors for the most part, that we, they made on these people who now wanna come back and give something, say, look, you changed my life. That's that's remarkable, and that's what you know we need to aspire to all the time. And we need to remember that sometimes the squeakiest wheel in the class, the student who's not getting their work done on time, who's ending up with a B plus C my, I mean B minus C plus uh, in the major, sometimes they turn out to be 
very successful individuals, very successful in everything they do. And in fact, we may not have known of the many other struggles that kept them from being the A student they really were. Nothing against A students, I'm not saying that. But I think we need to, um, to consider that. And sometimes we get donors who will even tell us, you know, I don't know how I managed, I wasn't that good a student. And you look at their lives and what they've done and what they've achieved and you wonder, well, how could that be? This had to have been an A honor student. In fact, the reality was very different. You know, they're very young when they're here with us. We want them to learn. We want them to do the best they can. But sometimes other circumstances, as we found out during COVID, uh, get in the way. Um, if you I want to turn to the dean's office tips or what I call dots, um, if you've looked at them after the break, you've noticed they've shifted in focus. So um, I, I want to get us mentally ready to actually go back to a more normal work and ordinary life, uh, anticipating post-COVID world. And one of the things that I've asked is that you share a podcast with me, and then I'll reshare them so other, others can listen to them. I'm really new to podcasts. I only listened to my first one last fall. Um, I find it can be addicting. Um, which is not a terrible thing, but I don't have that much time for that kind of addiction. So um, it does really um, um, make me think differently about uh, not only about the topics that I listen to, but uh, about the medium, like the, the medium for communication, the way um, we are talking to each other and the way we're trying to interact with other through podcasts. So I think please send me yours and I'll put some up every week. Uh, I have received about a dozen and what I'm going to do is collect them and then put them um, put them in a running list so you don't have to go into each week's list, you know podcast list and find something you can just look um, and if if all goes well they'll be mildly and I do this mean this mildly annotated so you know what it is because I get titles of podcasts and I can't always tell like what is the topic and so First, I listen very carefully, and then once, you know, I and then I can decide whether or not I like it. I'm listening to one right now. I don't want to share that someone in the college recommended last week to me, and I thought, I will never enjoy this. I am sure of it, and I can't stop listening to it. And I only listen on when I walk and in the car, so I'm limited every day. But that may be one of the reasons I came to the campus today as well. All right, that's all I wanted to say, and it's now time for your questions, so I'm going to, for the moment, be quiet and listen if there are any questions. Good morning, everyone. This is Karen, and I'm going to start with the question I see posted. And this question has come forward with multiple choice answers. And one of them could be all of the above or none of the above. Here's the question. Okay. For hybrid courses this semester, students are coming back to the classroom on Monday, this Monday, February 8th given social distancing requirements. How do I verify that a student in my classroom has submitted a negative COVID test to the university? Are students supposed to share that with me somehow? Am I supposed to contact the health center or, or another answer that you might have? Okay, wow, thanks. I, I, think I, I think I got it all down. If not, just Karen, let me know if I missed something. So first of all, I think, I think that's a question that many of us have. And I'll be honest, I don't, of course, teach. And most of the time I'm in my office, like I am now in meetings, meetings. I don't, I hardly ever get out of my office. I try to walk around about once a day, but I don't even get to do that always. Um, I'm concerned and I'm not gonna be in the classroom because suddenly we're gonna have all these additional people and then young people and so forth, people we don't know, strangers. Um, I think that's a, a uh, um, an important thing, and we shouldn't let that get in the way of us attempting this, right, to return to campus. Other universities have done it very successfully. Um, so again, I said earlier, we don't want to think of ourselves as police, but when you walk into that classroom, or if you come into the building and you have all these students, it's a different matter. But when it comes to your classroom, because you'll be spending time face-to-face, -face, you know, several times a week, um, there is something that was just announced um, after nine o'clock this morning. It should have come to your email. It's called Campus Tracker. I haven't had time to read the details, but if you look at your email, I'm sure it appears somewhere on, online. I mean, on our website too. Um, it, 
it at the very bottom of the message. Um, first, it describes what the tracker is, okay, and what it does. Uh, and it's a way for, I don't know if it's just students, but at least for students, every day they have to, um, you know, do that um, scan, self-reporting. And then students will be required, students who are either commuters or residential students, will be required to take tests every week. And so then that, that links up to this campus tracker, and that will allow you, and I don't know how it works, right? But it will allow you as a faculty member to go to your class list. This is what I'm assuming it means, um, and check, um, have people done the scan and have they been cleared to be on campus? It's supposed to be visually very, you know, appealing in the sense that there'll be a green check mark next to the name, the way I understand it. But again, I've never used it. So if it's different when you get in there, keep that in mind green check mark or an X. Um, I think everyone will be thrilled if they see the green check mark. Um, what do you do if there's an X? Well, to begin with, um, we want to be discreet, okay? We do not want to call out students in front of the class and say, hey, you, you know, you've got an X in front of your name. And I'm, I'm not really making this up. I mean, I get a lot of complaints about comparable types of calling out students. Um, I've heard about it at other universities. Um, so, you know, if it's one, even if it's two students, whatever, you call them individually, maybe step outside a minute or talk to them quietly so others are not able to hear. Keep the distance, of course, make sure you're masked and just say, look, you came up on my tracker with an X. And if they tell you, well, that can't be, I'm, I'm not gonna rule out an error, right? That could possibly happen. But, you know, be polite to them and just say, we. I can't have you in the class because of that. That's university policy. And, you know, they're not supposed to be on campus technically. They might then wonder what happens with my class today. Um, if there's a way for them, they really can't sit anywhere but indoors, right? To, to, to follow your class remotely. So I, I don't think there are great options. That's something I would talk about in your departments and, and decide what would our strategies be in a case like that. Um, I don't think you're going to find that very often. I think most students, if they are told they cannot appear on campus, they won't. Um, but we can't have them in the classroom if they have that X next to their name. So it, it really be, be polite, courteous, understanding, um, but you have to be firm. Can't keep, keep them in the classroom. Even if they said, well, you know, I've been cleared today, but it's not showing yet. You don't know that. You know, just like the students in the library telling the librarian, but we're roommates. We don't have our masks on at home. There's no way for us to know. That's not really our job to check them. Um, so that that's the best I can do with that answer. Did I answer the questions, Karen, or no? You got it. And I think we're all going to go read about the tracker after this uh, meeting. And we'll, we'll just see how it goes, right? We're going to learn. There's going to be some learning to come, right? But I think we'll be okay. I mean, I will be trying to be out a little bit more to see what's going on here and there. I know Teresa is very aware of it and many of you are. I mean, if you're really concerned about space use and things like that, whatever it might be, you know, if it's the way people, where people are eating their lunch, if they brought it in or the bathrooms, like we're too close in there, whatever it might be, let Teresa know, you know, you can always let, you know, Paul as I know, but Teresa is the one to know because she's going to probably be one of the first people to find a solution for us. So um, we'll see how it goes. I mean, many people have already been back to, to work or school in some way or form. And um, I think the testing and the daily scans are going to go far. So we're going to shift topics a little bit, but we'll, we will come back to that because there's a couple questions in front of me. Uh, this uh, question is about the podcast. And the question reads, are these podcasts we make or we have listened to in our adjuncts included in the call for podcasts? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I, I don't remember if I was only thinking of putting that in my message this week or if I actually put it to be truthful. So both is the answer to uh, the listen plus make. Um, I, I want to, as much as we can, to feature our work to ourselves. That's another thing I've learned reading through all of the files, you know, probably, you know, three or, or more dozen files, either for sabbatical, PTRM, or um, 
comprehensive review. There, you are all so productive, but how can we know what our colleagues are doing? And I hear this often, you know, from individuals or chairs, oh, we didn't know that was going on there, but it's really hard to know if we don't share that information. So if you have a podcast that you create, I don't know what the word is, produce, but in any case, you know what I mean, if, if it's your own, um, and you, you would like to share it, please let me know. And, you know, I'll be glad to, I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to screen all the podcasts. And since I'm so new to that world, I'm like really apprehensive. I know that you can get any of these podcasts on your own, um, but when it comes from a posting that the Dean makes, you know, I have to be a little bit more careful. I mean, I've had my kids tell me about podcasts that I would not necessarily share only because of my personal feelings about things. But um, um, some podcasts, um, the one that I'm thinking about that came from my 22 year old, it's, it's really fascinating, but I was disturbed on a number of levels. And I, I did a little search online and saw some reviews of it, uh, different kinds of, you know, outlets, not just the New York Times, which might be too stodgy for some people, but, you know, some less stodgy places. And the criticism was really quite severe because it, the assumption was that the podcaster went into an underprivileged community and essentially took advantage of them for his own benefit. Um, the podcast itself is, has some gruesome parts to it, and I don't particularly want to be sharing those podcasts. Social justice, though, issues can be very messy and very unpleasant for many people to hear. So I don't know what the line is right now. I'm going to consult clearly with people in the college. Um, but if, if there's a podcast that seems to be maybe pushing the line too far, I won't do it. As for adjuncts, anyway, you can find them on your own, right? As for adjuncts, um, I haven't included them on the Dean's Office tips. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what to do with that, but yeah, we, I'm more than happy if you send me their podcasts. I'm more than happy to consider them as well. Great, thank you for that. So now we wanna go back to the conversation about the um, process we put in place for uh, the health checks and coming back into the classroom. And this question is asking about the fall and will the process that you described earlier be the same in the fall? And Teresa is going to answer this question live, if that's okay with you, Chris. Um, the process of the tracker? If, if that's what you're talking about, from my understanding, yes. Or are you asking another question for me to answer? Yeah, the question doesn't indicate whether it's the track. It says, will, the, will that be the same process in the fall when we are back on campus? So what I hear you saying, Teresa, is that the tracker will be the same. And perhaps the questioner could put, see if, you know, confirm whether that's what um, they meant. And while they're doing that, I have another question, so let's pause on that one um, and ask the next question, which I think will be a faster answer. Are the building and classrooms open now? Yes, not today. I mean, it's a, when the campus is closed, the answer is no. <laughs> but um, Teresa, I believe everything is open. I haven't had to use my one card to come in like last week. I came in without the one card. Yes, all the academic buildings are open right now. Um, all of the classrooms that are due to be open in LA are open, of course, the swipe card classrooms and those areas are still closed. Um, it is my understanding that um, most of the dining facilities are open right now. Um, the LA Cafe is not open right now because of the quota that you have to make and no one is really in the building um, to allow them to make that financial quota. But beginning February 8th, when, so to speak, everything opens and all the classes are being hosted on campus that should be hosted on campus, all of those small little spaces like the LA Cafe are due to open. And by the way, we have 74 classrooms actively, 74 classes actively running in LA this semester. And, and we also have the vending machines and they have been actively used the whole fall semester. At least I've noticed some of the slots, you know, running short, which tells me people are using them. <laughs> so they're available too. As for the fall question, I, I think, I, I don't exactly know what the question was. I mean, understand the, the question, 
But um, as for the check process, or what did I call campus tracker, I think we just have to see how things are going by then. I would hate to say that that would be what we use in the fall because everything has been developing, evolving as we go along. So there may be, you know, different methods uh, to get us get the world back to a post pandemic norm. So Chris, I have more information on that question. Okay. So I, I think it was pretty much the, um, the quick scans. I've got to pull it up on my screen. The quick scan, scans and the tracker, if everyone's on campus, even if vaccines are more in place, how strict will we be about, um, how strict will we be you know, about who's eligible in class verifying that is there going to be a way to reach out to students in advance so that time at the start of class is not focused on screening. And, um, you know, there's a number of other questions. You know, let me just go through a couple of them. You know, we have about 10 minutes left, but let me uh, give you a Can I just say something, Karen, sure. before I run quickly, that I'm hoping this tracker tells the student, just like right now, if, if, you self, you do this daily scan and you say that you've been in contact with someone who was diagnosed with COVID, you know, that'll alert, and of course it'll tell you you're not allowed to come to campus, but it alerts the supervisor, whether it's your chair or, you know, of course it could be me if you're a chair and things like that. So I think there's some mechanism of communication. I can't believe there wouldn't be, but um, beyond that, I, I don't know. So they should be aware. Of, of so I can help staff. with that. I can help with that, Chris. Um, yeah, yeah. The first thing I can say is while we were doing, while you were talking, I did do the quick scan checker that um, was emailed at 9.04 this morning. And what happens is it takes you to Shibboleth for you to log in and it says, hey, Teresa Jenkins. And it has that green or the red exclamation point in my case is green, I don't mind sharing. Um, and so you can show that. I can tell you also, um, for those of you who don't know, I am the TU Staff Senate Chair. And as chair, I did ask about this and um, asked Steve Jones to talk to leadership about what faculty members should do and how they should handle this scenario in a classroom. And um, that was Thursday that I asked that question. I can say stay tuned and I will ask him again about this since it came up in this meeting because I meet with Steve Jones again at 3 p.m. today. So stay tuned on that and I'll make sure that Chris gets the information to provide to you. Thank you, Teresa, that's great. And then the next uh, uh, item is actually a comment about the tracker, so I'm just going to put it out there. And the recommendation is I think faculty have to ask students to show us their tracker results as part of attendance in the face-to-face -face classroom. And my sense is Teresa will get back to us on that. Okay. Um, so let me, and thank you for the response. <laughs> that's, the, the, that's the other. Uh, comment here. Another question about the building, and you know, for those of you who put questions, and I am skipping a little bit, trying to put some of these similar items together. When the LA Cafe opens, will students be allowed to be maskless in that area only, or, will they, um, or are they allowed to eat in any of the open areas with their masks off? And Teresa's going to take that question as well. Um, based on my understanding of dining room regulations, that when someone is eating, they're allowed to take their masks off. To my knowledge, Baltimore County has not implemented what Baltimore City and other places have implemented where, um, like Disney, when you're walking, you cannot eat and you cannot drink. So I would say that we would default to what Governor Hogan has said. And if TU leadership changes their mind on this, then we should look out for them. But again, if that's something that you want Chris or I to ask, we can follow up on that. I think that would be useful. I, I don't know the normal practice here. I, I suppose before COVID students and faculty and staff could walk around with like a cup of coffee and drink it in the hallway. I don't know about food. Like are they, are we allowed to eat any, in any of the areas with seating on any of the floors? Cause I've seen yeah. that with the, the, the cleaning staff does that but I don't know if that's normal. Yes, in LA the practice is you can eat anywhere. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thing to follow up on, Teresa, then. Yeah, that's good. The next item is, if we are back on campus, do you think we will continue to offer virtual learning as uh, an option since, for some, it is a good option? So by, by virtual learning, I'm, I'm, not, I'm understanding this, and it may not be the way you mean it, 
I'm understanding that is, will there be hybrid options? Um, I, I think that's very much on the table right now. I've talked to the provost already about um, our need to have, I want to have our special events as much as we can hybrid event to be hybrid events, whereas there's a live face-to-face -face component. And then we can let anyone in wherever they are, friends, alumni, community, com community partners, and so forth, donors, let them in virtually if they can't be here or aren't local. So I'd like to have that hybrid. One thing we've learned, if you've attended any academic conferences, what you know, many of them are seeing is much higher attendance this year and the attendance increases can't are typically not always communities that could not otherwise attend. Graduate students, people in other countries who, who you know, just can't because it's too expensive or they don't have time. Uh, people in this country, especially junior faculty who don't have uh, money to travel to conferences. And that has been an inclusive to me um, consequence of the uh, COVID, right? Um, pandemic, which is has so many negatives, that's one of the maybe more positive ones. As for classes, that's the part that I think we need to you know, discuss more. And I don't know all the mechanics of it, so I'd rather not say, I'm, not, I'm certainly open to the discussion about it. Yeah, we know that students want to be on campus. We know that they do better when they're face to face, but we also know that some students don't do so well. And I think especially with um, um, mental health, um, uh, problems that so many students um, have, I think it's important to consider mental health as an equity opportunity too. And I'll give you an example. So I had, um, uh, I've had students complain to me or indirectly to me through their chair or faculty member that they don't like being on camera or they don't like having to participate on camera because of their anxiety, you know, diagnosed anxiety. Okay. I can understand that. I mean, and I think if, if they have that anxiety, even being face-to-face, -face, well, I do think they, you know, we need to wonder, you know, uh, we, we need to think about um, their opportunity then for an education. Should it be, um, should they be able to zoom in uh, to a classroom? I, I don't have the answer right now. I do think it's something we need to, to think about and it isn't uh, um, something that will come upon us pretty quickly. So we have five, there's five minutes left. Um, and there's one comment that said that the guest lectures have worked well. Um, there might be a need going forward. And I think Teresa will come back with that information just for a little bit of clarification that, that in the past, the CLA building has allowed people to eat everywhere. However, um, currently, you know, under the COVID restrictions, we will be following the COVID restrictions as put in place, Teresa, uh, can you just clarify that? Because one other question popped up that raised that concern. So that is correct. When it comes to something like this, that is not a decision that I can make or we can make unilaterally. That is a decision that would have to come from TU leadership. And so um, the comment has been accepted. And what I will do in my meeting at three o'clock with Steve Jones is I will ask him about this, saying that this is a concern from um, that came from our meeting in CLA. And I'm quite sure that Chris will wind up having the same conversation either at Dean's Council or when he speaks to Dr. Perot, whichever one happens first. But I can guarantee you that that is a question I'm gonna ask today at three o'clock and I will get back to you more than likely through Dean Julos. Thank you, thank you, yes. and. You know, we do have the advantage of spring, right? Which we didn't have. We had winter to look forward to at the beginning of the fall semester. And I say that because as the weather does improve, I've heard that a lot of people do, you know, enjoy the outdoors on campus and they do eat outside and so forth. So once that happens, and we have to hope that that welcomes people out of the building to have their distance lunches, coffees, whatever, so they can socialize, have their masks off while they do that, of course, and be safe. Um, we have that to look forward to. I know I'm looking forward to it. I can also add that um, in the CLA building, we pretty much have one of the best um, HVAC systems um, on campus. And when this all happened, one of the things that facilities did, and I support it, was to um, 
increase the amount of air changes in the building. And so there's more fresh air being pumped out, pumped in, and more stale air being pumped out on a regular basis than what you've noticed before. Thank you. Great. And that brings you to two minutes. And um, there were no other questions. All right. Well, we, we are more than happy to give you two minutes back. Thank you, everyone, for joining this morning for your questions. Very much appreciate that. And um, I look forward to seeing whoever's going to be in the building, in the building and seeing you live rather than on my screen. All right. Have a good rest of the day. Enjoy the snow. Bye.